Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the FAA's General Aviation Safety Town Hall on Zoom and on the FAA's social media live streams. My name is Jamal Wilson, and I'm proud to serve in the FAA's Program Management Organization as the project lead for ADSB expansion in Alaska. I'm also an active GA pilot and the proud owner of a beautiful 1965 Piper that I operate out of Two Whiskey Five, otherwise known as Maryland Airport located about 20 miles south of Washington, D.C. This is the second in a series of GA and commercial airline virtual meetings we began holding last April to help the FAA, industry, and the public maintain situational awareness as COVID-19 impacted so much of our industry. Before we start today's town hall, I would like to provide you with a few housekeeping rules. First off, we're not here to solicit consensus advice or recommendations from anyone or to assign any task to the group, but we are really interested in taking your questions. To submit a question, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom. If you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, we'll be monitoring the comments there as well. Feel free to submit a question at any time. After the discussion, We'll hold a Q&A session where we'll give the panel a chance to answer as many of your questions as time permits. And for any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions are for background only. With that said, let's get started today. We're honored to have both FAA Administrator Steve Dixon and FAA Deputy Administrator Brad Mintz here to launch this event. Steve will speak first, followed by Brad. Administrator Dixon, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Well, thanks, Jamal. It's great to be here, and, uh, and thank you for your leadership and uh, dedication to uh, aviation safety and to our country, and of course, to the FAA, uh, and for moderating the program today. Uh, hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you uh, on Zoom. Uh, we're getting pretty good at this, uh, probably better than than we thought uh, we would ever be, yeah, but it's been a necessary part, a really indispensable way for us uh, to stay connected uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here with such an impressive uh, array of panelists uh, to discuss the topic of general aviation safety. And if you watch the introductory video earlier, uh, you know, before the program started, Though the, those human factors issues have never been uh, more important. It's always uh, important to have a very humble uh, and, and somewhat skeptical attitude about whether things uh, seem as they, whether they are as they really uh, appear to be uh, when you're flying airplanes. We come here today to share experiences, uh, learn from each other and uh, improve uh, both from the FA standpoint as a, regula a regulator and air navigation service provider, and as an industry uh, overall. And that's a standard uh, operating practice that we need to keep in place even after the COVID uh, masks are put away. It's not clear to any of us uh, when exactly we'll be able to do that, that is put the masks away. Uh, but with the expected availability of vaccines for all adults in the US uh, by May, I think we're all hopeful that we will be heading into summer in a much better place. And that's good news for general aviation uh, because May, as you know, is learn to fly month. And uh, maybe a renewed sense of optimism will get more people uh, safely uh, out to their local airports and into the doors of the flight training providers before too long. And the demand is there. Um, in a recent study, fl the uh, flight simulation company Redbird determined that there are about 40 million eligible and interested potential pilots in the United States population, about 60 times the current number of licensed pilots. So that's a lot of aviators out there and we wanna make sure that uh, our safe and dynamic system is there uh, for them now and in the future. For my part, um, I can promise you uh, that those who do take to the skies will find in the FAA a regulator that ensures safety while embracing innovation and delivering value uh, for our country and for the aviation system around the world. I think we have demonstrated that commitment and our actions to keep the aviation system 
safe uh, operating and keep airplanes in the sky uh, in the midst of a global pandemic this past year. One area, just as an example, that the FAA moved very rapidly in was regulatory relief. Uh, working with many of you in this town hall, we issued and extended critical timelines uh, for flight reviews, pilot medicals, training, and maintenance requirements to keep the entire aviation system operating and to help with the country's economic recovery. Of course, we didn't do any of this on a whim. Uh, with each extension, we evaluated the risks, considered the benefits, and included any necessary mitigations that we would require. As an example for pilot medicals, we maintain safety, but we also ease the burden on doctors and hospitals, giving them more time to treat uh, patients and victims uh, of the virus. These measures were effective, allowing us to phase out most of the regulatory relief on March 31st, just very recently. We also worked very hard to keep the air traffic control system up and operational through even the darkest hours of the pandemic, in part through innovative air traffic controller staffing measures and cleaning protocols that continue to be updated to this day. It wasn't easy, but we knew that aviation would be key to saving lives and jump-starting the U.S. economy and the world economy when the time comes. Of course, there are many, many more examples, uh, some of them we'll hear about today, uh, I'm sure, but I think we can all be proud of how we have uh, performed as an aviation community and as an agency um, during the pandemic. I also have to say that this new generation of pilots that we were uh, talking about a minute ago will benefit greatly from the partnership uh, that we have with our stakeholders. This town hall is the perfect example of your willingness to work shoulder to shoulder engaging with the FAA to lift up the general aviation industry. For example, we're making uh, flying safer for GA pilots through data-driven analysis and education partnerships, such as the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee or GAJSC, which you'll hear more about uh, later today as well. I think we all know that the aviation system that we had a little more than a year ago is not the system that we're operating in today, especially when it comes to safety. At a minimum, we have to look with fresh eyes on our standard operating procedures in proficiency, maintenance, and a host of other areas. Let's be self-aware. Let's conduct ourselves with a humble attitude and, and a, a, a big dose of humility. Be circumspect and careful about everything that we do. And let's not be shy about leaning on each other for solutions and lessons learned, just as we are here today. So with that in mind, um, I firmly believe that the best is yet to come. It is one of the most exciting periods that we have seen in aerospace and aviation in many, many years. We're anxiously watching uh, the surface of Mars for that Wright Brothers moment with the Ingenuity helicopter here in a few days. So a lot of great things uh, happening in aviation and aerospace and for this uh, entire industry. So thanks for listening. Thanks for participating today. And now I'd like to turn it over to our Deputy Administrator, uh, Brad Mims, uh, to share some thoughts and some uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Steve. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, as I'm referred to here lately as the new Deputy Administrator, uh, I'm the new Deputy Administrator, but I'm not new to the FAA. As many of you know, I served uh, in the capacity as the uh, head of the Office of Government and Industry Affairs, uh, dealing primarily with, uh, with the Congress, uh, state and local governments uh, throughout, the, throughout the country. And uh, I wanna say too, I'm not, a, I'm not quite new to GA as well. So I, I tell a quick little story if I can. Uh, when I was 13, 14, 15 years old and living in Washington, D.C., uh, my mom uh, worked for a defense intelligence agency, and she had uh, a few colleagues who were GA pilots. And uh, the bowling alley she used was uh, in Bailey's Crossroads, Virginia. Uh, you guys may know it as uh, the Crossroads Airfield. And uh, so what my mom would do is go in bowling. My brothers and I would go sit on the fence at the, uh, at the airfield and watch the, the GA activity 
uh, take place. And fortunately, at the time, so we thought, we, uh, my brothers and I would learn how to fly because a couple of her colleagues were GA pilots and had airplanes there. But in 1969-70, uh, the Charles E. Smith company bought out that, uh, that, that airfield and built those large monstrosities that I feel, I still, I still have an issue with that whole issue of the uh, airplane converting to, airfield converting into a huge uh, apartment complex. So I, I, that was tough for me. So fast forward, I go to work for the uh, FAA uh, as uh, the uh, Associate Administrator for uh, Government and Industry Affairs. And part of my responsibility was to make sure that those members of Congress and staff were familiar with the GA community. And one of the things uh, I really enjoyed uh, in, that, in that whole scenario was making sure that we took people like uh, Jim Kuhn and some other significant aviation uh, subcommittee staffers to Oshkosh, to the national, to the air show in Oshkosh uh, at uh, Whitman Field. And uh, for the four years that I was at uh, FAA, I look forward to that every year. And uh, I was, we were able to fly uh, myself and our colleagues uh, on the FAA aircraft to Whitman Field. We needed to oftentimes get back or the staff had to get back uh, quickly. And uh, David Henson, our former administrator was a, was a pilot and he piloted the, the Lear 31 uh, to, that, uh, to that destination. So it was great. Well, I spent the time with the staff, but at the same time, uh, I wanted to enjoy the uh, air show as well. And fortunately, uh, when staff left, uh, I had my colleague, Barry Valentine, and I hope Barry's in the audience today, but my colleague, Barry Valentine, who was the head of uh, API for, the, uh, for FAA, was a GA pilot, or is a GA pilot still. And uh, he took me throughout that entire complex and I was able to learn and learn some of the intricacies about the uh, GA community. And I just totally appreciate uh, that uh, with, with Barry. Uh, I'm saying all of that to say that, uh, you know, David, uh, that Steve just referred to making sure new pilots are, are representative of our country as a whole. And that means women, uh, men and women of all ages, races, colors, and creeds. We have to make sure that uh, everyone in this country gets equal access. Uh, and that means we have to remove barriers and hurdles uh, as we go forward. Some barriers involve business like F FBOs might want to treat small aircraft di differently than private jets and turboprops. Uh, others are more personal. Uh, sometimes people of color uh, don't feel uh, comfortable flying into certain airports because they're not treated well in those uh, destinations. Do women pilots earn the same respect and attention as their male counterparts uh, receive? Some, many times, no. Uh, when you hear pilots of a certain accent on the radio, do you question capabilities or intentions? You know, there's, there's an issue there sometimes. Uh, but, you know, we need to all give some thought on how we react uh, when we deal with these things. And uh, your comments and actions may seem insignificant, but they might be a hurdle for someone who is a little different than you who wants to enter the field. Passion for flight is what unites us all. And, as far, and it far outweighs what divides us or what may divide us. So... In conclusion, let's just stand together and make GA the destination for millions of women and men and kids who look to the sky and wonder, is that where I belong? So I just want to thank you for having me here today. I look forward to the panels as we go forward. And uh, Jamal, uh, I might kind of try to tag along with you one day uh, out in uh, 
out in Maryland to uh, see what the skies are like. So with that, I turn it back to you guys. Well, thanks, Brad. Appreciate uh, those words. And I'd uh, now like to uh, invite our uh, first panel uh, to join us. And uh, we'll get started with, uh, with the program here. Uh, with us today, we've got uh, Timothy Obitz, the uh, uh, president of, uh, of uh, NATA, uh, Mark Baker, the AOPA president and uh, chief executive officer, Jim Viola, the HAI president and CEO, Ed Bolin, uh, NBA president and CEO, and uh, Greg Pecoraro, the, the NASEO president and uh, chief executive officer. So uh, thanks uh, uh, guys for joining us today. Um, I'll start with some questions uh, for the panelists and we'll work through these fairly quickly. Uh, the first one uh, will go in order to Mark, Greg, Ed and Tim. And that is uh, really, if you can share with us, um, you know, the, uh, some of the challenges uh, that your organization and members faced over the past year um, during the pandemic and how have they adapted and evolved? We certainly all had to adapt and evolve. So Mark, we'll start with you. Thanks, Stephen, and uh, thanks for letting us uh, talk about this today. It was an unprecedented year, but it's, a, it's been a really amazing thing to see how a year ago, we weren't sure which direction aviation and general aviation was gonna go. We knew that the airlines were gonna be suffering uh, from this pandemic, but unknown a year ago was what direction general aviation would go started thinking as we had one of these panels before, it looked pretty good. It looks fantastic uh, for general aviation, piston and small turbo pop owner operated airplanes. In some cases at the peninsula, we've worked hard with the FAA and MBA. Uh, over the holidays, we saw a 200% increase in GA activity in Florida alone, uh, as we looked at what happened here in, over the holiday. And you know, general aviation has weathered this pretty well. There's still lots to be learned about flight training as you uh, offered and supported at the FAA about extensions on uh, and all the medical needs and other things. It was important for us to figure that out, work together. And largely the outcome has been safe growth. And I think long-term permanent. So we're gonna see a growth in general aviation use and activity that people have been exposed to this. Uh, this. And you know, as you know, it employs almost 300,000 people and you know, $250 billion of, of economics are related to uh, GA. So we've learned a lot, applied a lot, and we're looking forward to a better future when Ask off. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Greg, how about your perspective? Thanks, Steve. You know, just like the FAA, state aviation agencies had ongoing responsibilities during the pandemic. Although some employees started working from home, many still had operational responsibilities that kept them in the office or in the field. Aviation safety programs, such as inspections, state-owned nav aids, and training classes, as well as project planning and approval, have all had to keep going. State agencies immediately made use of technology, tools like teleworking, video conferencing, instituting remote inspections and monitoring, and using electronic signatures and document transfers to keep their state's airports operational and accessing federal aid. At the same time, many agencies faced a budget crunch as revenues from many aviation excise taxes and fees declined significantly. While others in the aviation sector received federal aid, state aviation agencies received none. Some agencies used the opportunity to focus on training, including some really innovative remote educational sessions for airport boards and commissions, and others inst instituted virtual planning sessions with airport sponsors to keep the work going. They continued the critical work of reviewing airport and helicopter or heliport development plans, construction and improvement projects, and reviewing proposed development projects near public airports, such as cell towers and tall structures. Everyone appreciated the increased federal aid to airports, but that presented challenges as well. Managing the huge influx of funds has been a significant lift for many state aviation agencies, especially those participating in the block grant program or with state channeling acts. The pandemic related assistance has in many cases tripled the usual amount of airport assistance flowing through a state per year. State agencies rose to the challenge, however, to deploy these critical funds expeditiously with almost no additional administrative support. This is a testament to their hard work and the strong relationships 
state aviation agencies have with their local and regional FAA counterparts and has led to some significant changes in the relationship with the FAA at those operating levels. While the relationships have always been strong, the need to deploy quickly led to some great outside the box thinking to get the job done for local airports. These aviation agency partners needed to work together to find solutions to difficult problems and an increased level of trust was critical. We're really glad to see that all those things happened and we hope to see those relationships and that trust grow to better serve our airport customers. Thanks, Greg. Really important stuff. Uh, Ed had a chance recently to speak at, uh, at your town hall. Uh, and I know we've talked a lot about uh, safety issues from NBA's perspective. What would you like to share? Well, I'd just like to share how important the last 12 months have been in working closely with the FAA, working with the federal government to help our community understand the environment as it is. You know, aviation was built up to operate in a fluid environment where weather changes, uh, different, uh, different mechanical situations arise. And we always try to build in redundancy, base it on what we think the situation is, confirm it, share each other's experiences. And that's really what this year has been all about. Uh, we've had an opportunity to work closely with you to understand uh, how we operate, even in an ATC zero environment, uh, how do we stay trained? How do we stay healthy and safe? Uh, making sure that the laws as they are written understand the environment that we're dealing with. So in a lot of ways, this has been aviation at its best. Plan A, plan B, plan C, always adapting and evolving. And, and you've been a remarkable leader in that. Uh, I also wanna point out, however, that this has not been a time for us to just stop and hunker down. We saw a lot of our members who used the, the drop-in business travel to get maintenance done, to revise uh, operating manuals, to install new avionics. And I think from our industry, we didn't just hit pause or go into hibernation. We continued to focus on innovation, new technologies, sustainability, promoting sustainable aviation fuels, uh, and certainly continuing to try to attract and retain the best and the brightest talent uh, by being open, diverse, and inclusive. So it has been, uh, it's been a challenging year, but I think it's a year like most cases when the pressure is really put on, you find out what is at the core and you emerge better and stronger. Well, thanks, Ed. Tim, how about the uh, NETA perspective? Very important part of our, of our aviation system. Uh, how have you and your members uh, overcome the challenges? Yeah, so uh, from the perspective of FBOs, uh, Part 135 and MROs, Ed hit it on the head. Uh, corporate flight departments and Part 135 operators and went to the maintenance shops to do the things that needed to be done that maybe they've been putting off for a while. And so they were inundated at first. However, when March 2020 happened, Part 135 and FBOs weren't so lucky. Everything came to a standstill very quickly. And the question then is, how do we preserve the jobs that we have? We've invested in these people in safety training. How do we keep them going? And obviously the CARES Act helped uh, as well, as well as working with the FAA that we'll talk about later about exemptions that NATA filed for. So like Ed said, the fluidity and motion of moving forward. So how do we go make lemonade out of lemons? And so that's what we worked on doing is uh, by creating a COVID task force, looking at creating a free safety first clean uh, so that you're clean when you're flying part 135 and FBOs and having an opportunity now that we don't, that was new, which was how do we message what general aviation does for the community? And so we put on a, uh, 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 sort of a dog and pony show of General Aviation Advancing America, where we flew around to General Aviation Airports uh, with Part 135 operators, meeting FBOs, talking about what that community, what general aviation businesses are doing in that community, moving doctors, moving nurses, moving sick people, moving COVID patients from rural America to the big cities so that they can get help and having people understand the economic driver that our industry does. And so we've had an opportunity uh, to basically re-message what general aviation is. It's not a bunch of rich people flying around. It's actually an economic driver and helping 
rural America being a gateway to it. And so that's what we worked on. So it's been a wonderful experience. Oh, thanks, Tim. And actually, that's a great segue to the next question that I had uh, for you. And um, we'll turn to, to Jim first. Uh, and, and this story may not have been told uh, to the degree that uh, a lot of people are really aware of it. So uh, Jim, can you share with us a little bit about how the GA community has helped the nation during the pandemic? Uh, things like vaccine distribution, uh, getting goods uh, and services to remote areas, and uh, is there any role that the agency has played that has either helped or hindered those efforts? No, absolutely. I appreciate the question. You know, with, with the exception of a couple of uh, mission segments, helicopters really haven't stopped flying during the pandemic. While, while the majority of the public quarantined, you know, essential workers stayed busy. And I would say in our community, a lot of those essential workers were in the air. The helicopter air ambulance fleet nationwide stayed very busy and they were doing just that carrying sick or injured patients continued they continue to carry blood and tissue for surgeries as well as organs for transplants so the challenge really was to maintain a sterile environment but like everybody else they took further steps some of the steps I already mentioned earlier to prevent that transmission of covid you know airborne law enforcement for example you know they continued to fly their missions while they were supporting their ground teams and conducting search and rescue missions and then the helicopters also continued with uh, to fight wilds and fires as California, Oregon, and Washington State, if you recall, suffered for some fires of historic size. So we know that the men and women of the FAA were very deeply affected by the pandemic as well as everybody else. And certainly grateful to you and your team as they were able to continue to do uh, what they had to support general aviation. You know, specifically, I think as Mark mentioned too, it was helpful to our operators, our pilots, and our maintenance personnel that the FAA worked with everyone to adjust those deadlines on expiring authorizations, on uh, pilot certificates, and as well as the medical certificates. So we really thank you for that. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Mark Baker, um, anything to add from uh, AOPA's perspective? Your, your members and you know the entire general aviation community, frankly, is what one of the things that makes uh, the aviation system in the U.S. unique in the world and uh, the how dynamic it is. Uh, so can you share with us your perspective on on what your members have done uh, during the pandemic? Well, certainly, you know, one of the things that hats off goes to the FAA is um, uh, keeping our airports open. Early on in the pandemic, as you might recall, there were a few communities that didn't realize that, you know, the airport is a federally sponsored you know, kind of a port that needs to be protected and kept access open and keeping that information flow going so that these 5,000 public use airports could be accessed for, again, for the PPE equipment. You know, as you know, the uh, Civil Air Patrol is a big part of moving vaccines in and around these rural areas into reservations and places like that. Without keeping those airports open, we'd have risked a, a big part of getting the access to these vaccines into these remote areas. So thanks to all for keeping that happening. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Tim? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, Mark and, and Jim hit it on the head, and uh, it's been remarkable how uh, general aviation and airport businesses, both Part 91 and Part 135, have really stepped up to help and uh, reach out to uh, rural America and help. I mean, there's been, uh, you know, FBOs and air carriers and airports that have made their facilities available uh, for vaccines. Uh, distributions. Uh, because why? You've got a hangar with a lot of space that you can socially distance apart and move the people in and out. And we have uh, members that will pick up people in rural America, for example, up in Montana, fly them to the big city uh, to get vaccinated and, uh, and vice versa, where they'll go up and be able to do 2,000 vaccines at a pop at an airport and get all the community there. So it's been really, really fun. It's really cool that we've been able to help and because we're all in this together. So it's been, it's been a, just fun to see. Thanks, Tim. We're, we'll stay with you uh, here for a moment uh, and then I'm going to move to Ed, but uh, can you share your perspective on how we have, uh, the agency in particular, has handled pilot currency requirements um, during the pandemic? Yeah, I think we've all talked about that but it's been exceptional, that's for sure. I mean, the FAA 
uh, has understood uh, the concerns and the needs and has worked with industry and has met on an ongoing base, basis, more than once a week, I mean, daily basis, hearing the concerns uh, so that we could get these exemptions. And so NETA, we filed for some exemptions, uh, worked with NBAA on those and A4A, and we were able to get them uh, on the uh, currency requirements uh, for pilots, like uh, Jim talked about, about the medical side. Uh, AOPA drove very hard on that one as well. Uh, to get that, that was a team effort and all the alphabet groups worked together very hard uh, with the FAA to, to make this happen. But what was really cool about it was that the FAA was very responsive and they understood the concerns, made the safety risk analysis that you talked about in your intro and listened. Another great thing that happened out of this that we hope will continue forward is on the check rides using video to make that happen. And we hope that that continues going forward. The FAA made that available for the various field offices. A bunch of them utilized it. Our members, uh, part 135 uh, people like that a lot and we hope that it will continue forward. Uh, so, you know, A plus, that's all I got to say for the FAA on this one. Uh, I, th I think, uh, and we'll talk about this uh, um, a little bit more in a moment, uh, but, uh, you know, out of a crisis like this there are often opportunities that are presented. So I think I think you hit on one of them. Ed, how about from your perspective on uh, pilot uh, currency requirements? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll also go forward with an A+. Plus. It, it has been an outstanding opportunity for us to communicate not what we can't do, uh, but what we need to do and the need to do it safely. And I think uh, the communication on that has been outstanding. Uh, Tim just referenced the use of video uh, and how that uh, enabled us to do more with what we have instead of just say we can't do it. Uh, I'll also point out beyond the currency, some of the, the leadership the FAA has shown uh, with regard to uh, the allowing uh, emergency use vaccines in our community, stepping forward and saying this is the right thing to do at the right time, we're moving forward. That type of attitude and that type of leadership is really what has allowed our community uh, to find ways not just to operate, but in some cases operate better. So it, uh, it's really been uh, a tremendous time of communication and cooperation while we've tried to figure out how we move forward, not with what we've lost, but with what we have. Well done. Well, thanks, Ed. Um, moving back to Jim for a moment. Uh, what has the GA community uh, been doing that we haven't heard about? Can you share a little bit more of your perspective on that point? Sure, I think uh, Tim mentioned it earlier too, the COVID clean as we called the program with HI where we want to address the amazing work the crews did to, to minimize the contact and keep their aircraft disinfected. I know the airlines got a lot of attention for their efforts, but no one really stopped to think about the necessity of like keeping firefighting or law enforcement aircraft actually clean, you know, as the crews rotate and do those missions. If those crews had gotten sick and spread the disease even further, they could have had crippling results, especially in the firefighting last summer, summer that I mentioned. And the next thing I doubt most of the general public thinks about is the training. And I know we certainly, I think, have all touched on it already and, and the importance of the work that the FAA did to allow us to, to extend some of that. But flying is a skill that can deteriorate if it isn't done regularly. And, and as Mark was saying, you know, it was kind of iffy early on with the, with the airports and, and some of the things as to, as to where you can fly and where you can train. So I'd like to salute the pilots who spent their downtime doing things that were a little different, working with simulators or other devices. I think we got, you know, tried to talk more into open up those flight manuals for their aircraft, uh, getting even into the maintenance manuals, learning more. So they kept themselves ready to fly through alternative means. And I think we saw a lot of that going on so that they're always ready to safely fly their missions. And that training part, I think you, I know you know it well, is a huge safety factor. And so when it comes to training for those missions too, I like to point out a couple of helicopter missions that aren't always in the front of the public, but still keep the public going immensely. One is the, uh, help, that the helicopters that help farmers produce our food with agricultural spraying. We had helicopters that help keep the lights on with installation of power towers, inspections of our national grid, and especially during the ice and snowstorms, you know, that we experienced this winter. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Mark, any, any additional comments? 
Yeah, I'd say that, you know, the, this community is really booming in the, in the GA sense of the new aircrafts that are even available for sale right now. They're not sold out this year. I know Oklahoma City is busy and doing registrations at, at crazy levels. Um, and we've seen aircraft financing just booming here. So I think there's a lot of things going on in the GA community, including what you mentioned. A lot of people are interested in flying and anecdotally we'll see what the student start, starts look like here uh, for a fact, probably another couple months. But it appears that last year, from the information we got from flight schools, there was a surge of people in their 40s, not people that are airline, you know, kind of directed or personal flying, more interested in that, jumping into aviation like never before, as you saw in other recreational activities, uh, boating or RVs that boomed, as did aviation. And I think also from a business perspective and accessing some of these communities, we're going to see a, a really long-term growth in GA. So. Um, be prepared for that. I think you need to add, continue to add more DPEs, more examiners. Steve, there's going to be a lot more need for that. I hear you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Greg, how about the sales perspective? Sure. You know, Steve, state aviation agencies have stepped up in big ways to manage the impacts of COVID, adopting many newer protocols to support continued aviation activity despite the pandemic. In many states that have remote and rural areas, the importance of a strong general aviation airport network has been highlighted by increasing activity, not only from pandemic related needs, including medical transport, vaccine delivery, and other things we've mentioned, but also in terms of everyday essentials being delivered to remote areas by general aviation. Some agencies have been able to help and support COVID relief activities, such as mask, mask and vaccine deliveries. We've noted that there's a lot of um, non-COVID activity uh, still happening or ramping up. You know, we've, we've talked about the fact that flight training has remained robust. And you know, as air travel resumes, the pilot shortage will return at some point. And general aviation is a key to solving that looming problem. So I'm excited to hear about those new levels of activity. And state aviation agencies are certainly playing their part to, uh, to assist that. Many state agencies are also actively engaged in initiatives to better understand and plan for emerging aeronautics technology. For example, what eVTOLs and unmanned aircraft will mean for GA airports and the communities around them. While the FAA and NASA are still in the left seat in terms of the larger regulatory framework, there's an important role for states to play here. And it's critical that these transformative technologies be planned for and integrated in ways that provide benefits to the entire community and minimize any negative impacts. Great, thanks, Greg. Well, we're running a, a little bit behind here, so I'm going to ask for, this will be a lightning round on the next question, because I want to try to give uh, Jamal an on-time arrival here. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll go to Ed, Tim, and then close with Greg. Uh, maybe one or two examples of some best practices and some opportunities that you think have emerged during the crisis that you might envision us carrying forward into the future and how do we continue to enhance safety as we return to the new normal uh, of, uh, of aviation operations? So we'll start with that. Well, I, I think uh, a lot of it deals with uh, understanding what the environment is. And I think uh, understanding, for example, and it's already been talked about, how to operate in teams, how to disinfect airplanes, how to operate in ATC zero environments, all of that gets to kind of core competencies that we have had about planning, sharing experiences, learning from each other. And I think it just gives us an opportunity to double down on that, but to leverage new technologies as we do. Today, we're having an opportunity to talk on a video conference with you and reach a huge part of the GA community. I think understanding that we have an opportunity to leverage technology leverage our networks to get the word out, whether it's the great news about what we're doing for uh, to, it, to address the uh, epidemic or uh, the pandemic or what we're doing to promote safety or bring in a new generation of leaders from uh, diverse backgrounds. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Tim? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it, it hits on the head there with the issue of safety. You know, we, we obviously want to operate in a safe way. And so FBOs and part 135 operators have really focused like what uh, Jim talked about, about the safety first clean, about having a cleanliness standard, making the customer uh, feel comfortable, uh, making the pilot, uh, caring for the pilot because they're under a lot of stress themselves 
and making sure that the whole experience occurs well. So now we've got FBOs uh, that have adopted a safety system. And you're gonna be talking later about safety management systems. So now we've opened the door. So we need to continue the safety narrative going forward uh, as we move forward uh, for all. And so this has been an, an opportunity once again to take this experience of where we're so concerned about cleanliness and creating a safety culture about cleanliness and be able to move it forward and adapt it to other aspects of the business. Thanks, Tim. Greg? Yeah, Steve, last March, we all jumped into the deep end of the pool with virtual technology at the outset of the pandemic. And we learned that these virtual platforms work and can really make us much more effective in a lot of ways. Um, greater reliance on these and other technologies that allow us to do our jobs more efficiently and effectively from existence are gonna stay part of the mix. And I think it's, criti it's critical that we continue to figure out the best way to do that without losing you know, our ability to, uh, to you know, have a personal touch to things. But you know, ranging from remote inspections to using drones or electronic transmittal of documents, all this stuff is gonna stay with us and be critically important. But beyond that, breaking down the barriers to intergovernmental cooperation that were so necessary during the pandemic also needs to be part of the new normal. We got creative to get things done and we should be careful not to unlearn those lessons as we emerge from the crisis. Oh, thanks, Greg. No, great points. And, uh, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, we, we need to remember the lessons learned, but we also need to take advantage of the opportunities that have been presented. So we've got some new tools in our, in our toolkit uh, and some, some processes that can make us all more effective. So, uh, well, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see you all and, uh, and all of our attendees today. Appreciate, uh, you know, your, your comments and your perspective. It's been a very timely discussion. There's a lot more that we, uh, that we could and, and, and should talk about. I appreciate your candor um, and look forward to uh, continuing dialogue on, uh, on these and a whole host of other issues. Um, I'm gonna ask the panel one members to turn off your cameras now. And again, thank you for being with us and thank mute you, your Steve. mics. And, uh, and we will uh, now I'll turn it back over to uh, Jamal to set the stage for our next panel. And then uh, I'll come back with some uh, closing comments. So Jamal, back to you. Thank you, Steve. That was a phenomenal panel. And I do wanna take the time right now to extend a very, very heartfelt thank you to everyone that participated in the discussion and for helping me and the FAA to better understand not only the challenges, but the opportunities, very important. As I said earlier, I'm extremely optimistic that we will accomplish great things together. In the next segment, Glenn Martin, the Vice President of Safety and Technical Training for the FAA's Air Traffic Organization, will lead a panel to discuss safety challenges and the post-COVID-19 outlook. But before we get started there, I'd like to take a moment now to share some critical information with you. The FAA and CDC have an important message for the general aviation community about COVID-19. We applaud your contributions during the pandemic to get vaccines, people, and supplies to remote and underserved areas. But we're still in the thick of this pandemic, and we want you to continue to stay safe by staying up to date on CDC guidance. CDC has aviation-specific procedures for general aviation pilots or companies that transport passengers who have or have been exposed to COVID-19. This is for any flight to, from, or within the United States. And Companies that arrange flights must follow the same procedures as general aviation operators. We want to make sure the GA community follows CDC's procedures. Working together, we can keep everyone safe and healthy. Follow the FAA on social media and go to cdc.gov to learn more. Thanks for listening. And now over to you, Glenn. Well, thank you, Jamal, and uh, welcome everybody. I'd like to now invite panel two members to join us. Again, thank you everybody for coming in today. For panel two, we have with us Richard McSpaden. He is the Senior Vice President for AOPA's Air Safety Institute. Sean Elliott, who is the EAA Vice President for Advocacy and Safety. 
John Dermody is the FAA's Office of Airports Director for Safety and Standards. Tony Schneider is the FAA's Air Traffic Organization's Director of Safety. And Justin Barkowski, who is the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for the American Association of Airport Executives. Welcome everybody to the panel today and thanks for joining us. I'd like to start with some questions for the panelists and this first one, will be for Richard, Sean, Tony, and Justin. So let's start in. Uh, what changes has the pandemic introduced into the GA sector and how have these changes affected the GA workforce or your members? Richard, if I may start with you, thank you. Yeah, Glenn, thank you and good afternoon and thanks to the FAA for hosting this uh, town hall. You know, about a year ago, when this pandemic started, uh, activity dropped off a cliff really. And we were all worried about that because inactive pilots and inactive airplanes by themselves are, are bad in combination, they become a real safety concern. Um, but what we saw is that pilots kept their uh, proficiency up through alternate means. They took advantage of the downtime. Our consumption of safety material was accessed over 12 million times. And that's just the Air Safety Institute from last year. And the data shows that they did a good job with it. So it looks like that uh, we'll end fiscal year 20 when the numbers finalize about the same accident rate, maybe even slightly lower than 19. And in fiscal year 21, we're off to one of the best starts we've had in a couple of decades. So all that seems to indicate that the measures that we took, you know, the SFARs that were very helpful to us in GA, they were measured, they were taken deliberately with a lot of focus. And it indicates that uh, general aviation pilots did a very good job of thinking about how to come out of this downtime. Great, Richard, thank you. Sean, can we get your thoughts? Yes, sir, Glenn, thank you. And uh, thanks to Administrator Dixon and the FAA staff for, for putting this together, as Richard said. Uh, much the way Richard McSpadden just mentioned, obviously uh, we have been pleasantly surprised at the level of activity. And uh, as others have, have indicated, Obviously, um, people kept flying. And in some respects, I think uh, like you would see new members of families being born out of a pandemic, you're gonna see new aircraft or amateur built aircraft uh, coming to life uh, as, a, as a part of the resultant of this um, difficult situation. The increased time at home, uh, the increased focus on activities such as uh, building your own airplane uh, and, and completing our DARS that are doing final paperwork inspections report uh, record levels of activities. Also from a, a training perspective has been previously mentioned, we're seeing uh, lots of new tools that are going to be significant and will remain well after things finally do subside. And as was said, we're able to put the masks away in the drawer once and for all. Um, certainly remote um, uh, activities and remote training. Uh, our webinar series uh, within EAA has been setting record after record uh, overall, in 2020, we had 53,700 uh, attendees of our various webinars throughout the year. And in particular, our two focused events, uh, the Spirit of Aviation event, which was a pseudo uh, substitute for Air Venture, and then our Home Builders Week in the middle of wintertime, um, both had absolute record numbers and, and high levels of activity, well north of 15 and 16,000 attendees each. So I think you're going to see greater access to valuable information, education, uh, remote activities, remote training, and even those of us that are in the business of being designees, examiners, et cetera, the ability to have remote observations accomplished uh, and work directly with our FAA managing specialists uh, in meaningful ways with more remote technologies will ultimately be here to stay to some degree and be very helpful in maintaining that relationship and maintaining a high degree of safety standards within the designee community as well. Great, thank you very much, Sean. Tony, how are these changes affected you and your workforce? Thanks, Glenn, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really an honor to be here with you today. Um, one of the things I think I've learned over my FAA career and one of the things we live in the FAA is that with great cha challenges, comes really great opportunity. And so like all of you, I think a lot of us have been forced into a virtual environment, which has really created an excellent opportunity for us to connect with general aviation pilots. Um, I just want to call your attention to three different ways we've connected 
and offer you or extend an invitation to you that if you haven't participated in those, you can jump on those. Uh, the first one is the runway pilot uh, simulator. As most of you know, it, it can be a little bit complex navigating on the airfield and what that looks like. And so this new tool that we've created, the runway pilot simulator, you can actually uh, practice you know, your navigation on an airfield as ATC is giving you clearance. You can read the uh, signs and try to hold short uh, of where you need to. And so it's a great opportunity. We also have the From the Flight Deck videos, which are just a great tool to educate and inform you on some of the risks that we're seeing in the NAS. And finally, uh, we're seeing a significant increase in general aviation pilots participating with us in our airport runway safety action teams. Uh, where we're learning a lot from you uh, about risk in the NAS and what we're hoping is you can help us mitigate that risk. And so we would like to extend an invitation to you. And so if you check the chat, uh, Allison is gonna post uh, a couple of links for you to jump on those and to be part of our team and um, participate in, in those uh, areas. Thank you very much, Jeff, or Tony. And now over to Justin. Thanks, Glenn, and uh, thanks to the FA for putting on this great virtual event. Uh, we're really excited to be here today. Uh, there are a few changes, I think, in the GA sector that we've seen, and uh, we wanted to highlight from the airport perspective. Um, and really, I'd start with the, the types of operations that we're seeing. Um, I think the impact has been the kinds of operations that are occurring at our airports. Um, I'll start with some of the good news. I think we've heard it here already today with some of the uh, light GA operations, I think, have seen substantial increases uh, in, in many parts across the country. Uh, a good portion of the traveling public that um, is still interested in traveling uh, has discovered air charter and private <laughs> leisure um, uh, opportunities. So that's always been a, a good benefit, and we've seen a significant increase there. Um, at the same time, it hasn't all been good news. I know uh, as we are here today, everyone's working in a remote environment. Many people are working from home. So I think we've seen pretty significant drop in business aviation activity um, across the system. So, you know, it's, it's hard to predict uh, across the country uh, a single answer. I think different parts of the country are seeing different trends depending upon where you're at. But I think the importance of understanding the types of operations um, for us airports is just on the revenue piece and the financial implications. Uh, so much of the financial piece is important to making sure that we're providing a safe operating environment uh, for the users, which at the end of the day is our goal. Um, you know, while the increased private air travel has definitely helped, um, revenue has notably declined. And so, you know, it's been, it's been a challenge for airports, uh, keeping their airports safe. Um, just as an example, you know, deferred maintenance programs, focusing on safety critical items first, um, and maybe putting off some of the less critical items, you know, airports are having to look at those types of programs. Um, so really the, the changes in the operations along with the financial implications have definitely impacted our members the most. And I would just sort of end on one final note with the, the stress on the GA airport staff and workforce. Um, I think not surprisingly for many of our organizations, you know, we're not immune to the, the morale and the personal stress that our workforce is under um, on a daily basis. So um, it's always important to keep in mind though that safety and keeping our airport safe is uh, the, the reason why we're here. So, but I just did wanna mention that because it's a very important point for many of our members. Thank you very much, Justin. And, and for everyone's comments there on that first question. Moving over, uh, we have a, the G8 Joint Steering Committee, very familiar with the community. It is a data-driven safety collaboration. So for this question, how has your organization worked with the steering committee to leverage that data over the past year in order to improve safety? I'd like to first start off with John. Thank you, Glenn. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, in our, in our office, the FAA Office of Airports, uh, we've been a leader in the use of safety data for better decision making for quite some time. Uh, we've done both the commercial and uh, the GA side. Um, over the past few years, we, uh, we've really been analyzing runway incursion data so we can develop and implement our runway incursion mitigation program, which is commonly known as RIM. Um, and that covers both commercial and GA airports. Um, we are fortunate to have Administrator Dixon at the helm now. Uh, he truly sees the necessity to learn from big data. And I think that's what we're all uh, going towards, you know, with, uh, within each of our line of businesses, within the FAA and also externally on learning from data. 
Um, we do participate in numerous teams under GAJSC, the uh, General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, uh, such as the Safety Analysis Team and the GA Issues Analysis Team. We're also very involved with each of these specific uh, GA safety enhancement reviews and the wrong, uh, wrong surface efforts as well. And we're relying on the data rich environment within GAJSC to learn about GA air, uh, accidents and uh, incidents um, really on airports to see what we can do to develop a plan on how we can mitigate those issues in the FAA office of airports moving forward. Um, we've been participating in uh, the hotspot standardization and the addition of the uh, new symbol on the airport diagrams, which I think is a great step forward to be able to visualize that for pilots, uh, highlighting uh, wrong surface uh, landing risks right, right in the publications. And uh, data from these efforts uh, and other efforts we've been involved with um, have been used to create our first ever uh, draft of a GA accident review report within the Office of Airports. And um, that's something we're looking to actually start socializing through the JSC and, and others on what we're learning. And it's really describing airport conditions that have either, you know, may have contributed uh, to an incident or an accident. And uh, really at the heart of this is drilling down into that data to really understand what are some of the root causes, what are the, some of the contributing factors, and what can we do in the office of airports um, to mitigate those and improving airfield geometry and signage and marking and lighting and everything else that we can, uh, we can help with. And notwithstanding, I know uh, Justin's comment, there's, there's always this balance between safety and, and money. And I think our job in the office of airports is really to prioritize that. You know, where can we have the best bang for our buck? And, and it really, it revolves around the safety data and really analyzing that to understand how we can prioritize that as far as our policies and our standards moving out. Thank you, Len. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, turn it over to Sean. How is your organization working with the steering committee? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Glenn. Um, obviously, GAJSC is something that EAA has fully vested itself in and, and participated in for well over a decade now. Uh, many know that um, Richard McSpadden and I uh, pass the baton back and forth every three years as the industry co-chairs for the GAJSC and the steering committee. Uh, the focus and the model that was built back in 2010, based on all the success that the commercial air safety team had experienced and reduction of, of fatal accidents within the airline industry, has really been the mantra for how we have focused this last decade. And, and looking at accident prevention and safety enhancement uh, in a data-driven way has been very impactful. It's been impactful, I think, for the industry as a whole. It's collated our, our messaging together to get out to, to a better point of reaching the unreachable um, and truly reducing the metrics of those, um, uh, those fatal accidents. I, I proudly state that you know, the experimental amateur built community has reduced its loss of control fatal accidents, which from a data standpoint has been the absolute biggest item on the Pareto chart, uh, almost 35% in the last 10 years. So that's, that's significant. And that's all because of the approach that the JSC takes and the focus to, on data as focusing your solutions and your efforts, uh, driving it in that direction. So we very much believe in that and uh, I'm proud to be a part of that. And as I said, uh, Spad and I have a, have a great time uh, co-leading that and passing that baton back and forth every three years. Great. Thank you, Sean. Richard, your thoughts? Yeah, the, uh, it's a two-way street, really, with the data that comes out of the GAJSC, because we take that and build the AOPA courses that are free to anyone. They go free to anyone who wants to access them on safety. And um, our courses, and then, of course, the NAL report is generally considered kind of the report on general aviation safety. It's, uh, it's utilized across the industry, and we break it down in terms of the data that we see coming off of NTSB accidents and produce that report every year. So we help provide that data and then we use the data that comes out of the GAJSC to help supplement that and then build our uh, training material. But I think the GAJSC I'm extremely proud of because it's a large organization and it has people from all over the industry. And as you can imagine that many people, sometimes there's different points of view but what we always do is go back to the data in terms of what are the things we should focus on. And then once we make that determination, what elements should specifically we go after? 
Is it more communications? Is it better equipment? Is it better training before we make our recommendations and our and finish our safety enhancements? So uh, I think I agree with Sean. I think if you look at the fatal accident rate in general aviation has dropped some 50% over about the last 20, 25 years. And I think the GAJSC has played a big role in that. That's great. Great work definitely being done there. Thanks, Richard. Uh, next question. How has the pandemic affected the health of GA flight training, especially as it applies to a pipeline, the pipeline that it is for commercial cargo and, and even military aviation for that fact? Uh, I'd like to go back to Sean for this. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, obviously, it's been an interesting dynamic. When you look at flight training, as has been said already, Overall activity has certainly increased. Uh, there's a lot of flight training activity taking place. We're seeing designees uh, in a busier state than ever before. Uh, AMEs, pilot examiners, um, maintenance examiners. Um, training overall has certainly had a significant uh, impact uh, from the pandemic. And that's great. Uh, but along with that, we've also seen challenges. Uh, and certainly things like getting a, a check ride scheduled in a timely fashion being able to find a designee that's not booked too far out. Um, I, I think it's really emphasized the overall value and importance of the designee community for the overall health of general aviation and to keep that pipeline flowing without a bottleneck. So I, I, I'm particularly pleased to see that. Uh, I think some of the work we've been doing in the designated pilot examiner reform work group will uh, help provide future strategies for um, ultimately meeting that challenge. And it, it certainly has doubled the emphasis on the importance of the designee community overall uh, as we move forward uh, within general aviation. All right, thank you, Sean. Richard, uh, what's your perspective? Yeah, you know, when, we, when activity uh, stopped uh, or, or, you know, took that big uh, drop, and we were all kind of worried, you know, can we fly? Should we be flying? What's the right thing to do? And then when people figured out, not only can you be flying, but you should be flying to keep your proficiency and continue your training. And it seems like a lot of people realize that coming out of this pandemic, we're still going to get back into that big hiring curve. And general aviation is a big pipeline for military and for uh, airlines, not just in this country, for around the world. And it's a real, it's a real treasure we have in this, in this country. So I agree with Sean. The first thing we saw was actually helpful because before the pandemic, we were seeing flight instructors, what they typically do, they'll start in GA, they get the hours they need, and then they move to the airlines. We had a bit of a shortage of flight instructors. And then during the pandemic, when a lot of airline pilots were on furlough, a lot of them came back and helped with that instructor problem. So that's been a real positive thing. Uh, the challenge I think we continue to see is, as Sean mentioned, the DPEs. And a while ago, the FAA loosened some restrictions on DPEs in terms of what they could do on a daily basis and their regional uh, activity. And that was helpful. I think we saw the impact of that in a very helpful way. But I think we got to look at doing more and how do we get more DPEs so that isn't the choke point of the, of the system. That's great. All right, next question. Um, gonna come to you, Tony, on this one first. How is your organization utilizing safety risk management in its work and, uh, and for its operations. Hey, thanks, Glenn. Um, it's interesting, when I was in college, we had a sign at the front of the classroom that said, flying is a lot like sailing, but a lot less forgiving. And so it's kind of uh, the crux of SRM, right? Safety risk management. In safety risk management, it's really about mitigating hazards to flight by introducing layers or, or different mitigations that, that can help lessen the severity of those type of things. Uh, in our organization, we've integrated SRM into everything we do. We use it to, as we're building new tools and procedures. Uh, also, we're using it to monitor the, the NAS in real time and then implement safety mitigations so you can get to your destination safely. Um, we, we recently have branched out into looking at measuring potential risk, which is really an exciting area. We're using new computer automation and machine learning uh, to start to look at um, uh, the risk uh, before they occur. And so the idea is if we get in front of accidents and incidents, uh, we can strengthen those barriers that keep you uh, flying safely uh, throughout the NAS. Some of the areas we're currently looking at or keeping an eye on 
our pilots uh, overshooting the turns to final for parallel runways. We're looking at wrong surface landings. Uh, we're also looking at departures or, or wrong way departures or, uh, that occur at an intersection. Um, our belief is that by uh, layering safety mitigations and using SRM, we can identify that what's working and what isn't working, which ultimately makes the NAS safer. And so I'm really excited about the work we're doing on SRM and um, I'm really excited about being able to uh, share those things with you today. Back to you, Glenn. All right, thank you, Tony. If I could uh, pass this question over to John. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, so safety risk management all starts with the data. Um, and we're analyzing that data to make the uh, better policy decisions. Um, and it starts with the data collection. So we've noticed as we looked into this that, um, especially on the, uh, on the GA airport side, it's tough to, to get the good data right off the bat. Um, you know, and unless you have that data, you really All right. That's an incident. Have, there he is. Hey, hey, John. Yeah. I, I apologize to interrupt you. You cut out for us for just a moment there. If you can back up a sentence I, so we could catch it, please. Sorry. Yeah, sure. No problem. Can you hear me okay now? Sure can. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so we noticed uh, that, uh, and I'll just back up just a little bit, I guess. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it, it really does start with the data collection. So we're, we're really looking, working with a line of businesses to enhance the accuracy of the, uh, the data collection for accidents and incidents at GA airports. Um, you know, by doing that, that'll uh, let us evaluate that data to see if there's anything we should do on airport operations or design standards, um, things that may have contributed to an accident or incident. You know, and, and really that's something where we need to, to understand that data so we can figure out, uh, do we need to change a standard to improve things? Uh, for example, uh, for runway excursions, uh, right now we, you know, for, especially on the GA side, we don't really get the distance where a wreckage is from the center line of a runway. And, and that could help us um, look at the runway width or the runway safety area standards and make alterations accordingly to, to improve, uh, improve safety. And uh, we're, we're actually working right now on a standardized national checklist where we can uh, provide that to our regional airports offices. And when they go out to a GA accident or incident, they can use the standardized checklist and report back the same data so we can figure out, um, you know, on a national basis, what are some of the common factors? Um, so we can, uh, we can look at the standards associated with, uh, with GA airports. And um, we are, uh, uh, not only are we, are we doing this, we're actually putting it as part of our, uh, our strategic plan and our business plan. So it's become one of the main uh, focuses for, uh, for the office of airports on the, on the safety side is GA safety. We know that's the, uh, a, lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the accidents and incidents in a NAS are involving GA activity. Um, so it is something that is first and foremost in our business plan effort, and it's something where We've really um, looked at this uh, not only from the safety side, but we have you know the planning and environmental and the programming uh, and the financial side. It all it all comes together, you know, to be able to look at this, to plan it, to assess the risk, and then uh, a lot of the uh, the NIPIUS airports, the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems, th those federally obligated airports, we have the ability to provide federal assistance to help make those safety improvements. So we're in a unique position there in the office of airports. Thank you, Glenn. You bet, John. Thank you very much. Richard, uh, if I could, how is your organization utilizing the safety risk management and its work and so forth? Yeah, thanks, Glenn. I think this is an important concept that kind of illustrates the difference between general aviation and professional flying, like Part 121 and military flying and those kind of things, because general aviation is a wide bucket. It's personal flying, it's adventure flying, it's recreational flying. And so to push it too far on that end of the spectrum towards 121 part 135, we all know how you make things safer in the military and the airlines. They take an enormous amount of judgment away from the pilot. Everything is regulated. Everything is at an office procedure. If we did that, we would kill general aviation. So the balance has always been, how do we cherry pick the things that work from 121 and military and pull them into the general aviation environment in a reasonable way that doesn't strangle activity? So one of the things we came up with is something we call a scalable uh, safety framework. 
and it takes a uh, it takes a, an SMS program, and it sort of skinnies it down, and it helps organizations figure out how they could build a uh, an SMS type program, a safety uh, risk management type of program that is uh, tailorable to their organization, their mission, their size, the style of flying that they do. And uh, we, we've worked that with Angel Flight and a couple other organizations and had some pretty good response to it. And we think that's really the key to help figure out how you build these big, massive programs. Because if you're not careful, they're just shelfware. Uh, they're very effective in part 121 in military. But if you try to impose that too heavily on GA, it'll just be shelfware and it could actually have a negative effect as opposed to a positive one. Very, very good comments there, Richard. Certainly appreciate the conversations we can have to find that right mix, very much yeah. so. All right, uh, the next question. What are the major infrastructure challenges facing airports today and in the future? I'd like to start with Justin on this one. Well, thanks, Glenn, for the question. Uh, obviously, inter infrastructure needs and infrastructure in general is a huge topic right now, not just in aviation, but uh, throughout the country. So uh, the needs are far and wide. Uh, no surprise there. Um, it, John referenced the report, but Office of Airports uh, latest indication that uh, over $43 billion in projects that are needed uh, under, a under the airport improvement program over the next five years. Uh, that's obviously for all airports. Specific to GA, I think it's a little over $14 billion. So a lot of needs out there uh, for all of us. Um, but the biggest challenge for us is how are we gonna pay for all of this? Um, that's always where the disputes come into play. Um, as I mentioned earlier, airport revenues are, are down over the past year. So uh, we do have a lot of ground to make up um, over the coming years in the post pandemic environment. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about a few things that I just wanted to highlight. You know, airside infrastructure um, is always the most important. Obviously, safety is key. Um, you know, a lot of good feedback from our members about the airport improvement program in general uh, continues to be a valuable resource to get a lot of those projects done. It's never enough money, as, as we all know. Uh, there's always more that we need. Um, so we've supported proposals to get um, to, to boost the amount that AIP would provide each year. Uh, to meet those needs and we were glad to see that was included in the recently unveiled uh, American Jobs Plan. So, so that was good news. Hopefully some of these discussions continue. Uh, you know, working with our tenant partners, our FBO partners um, is a huge piece of this too. Um, they make critical investments at our airports um, each and every year. So you know, our members value those relationships. Um, so supporting them, making sure that we have a strong partnership with them is gonna be critical moving forward. And then lastly, I would just say on, you know, what, what does the future of GA airports look like? And I think that's going to help us uh, hone in on what the needs are in the future uh, for, in terms of infrastructure. There's been a lot of discussion about advanced air mobility, uh, new electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft continues to gain a lot of attention and, and rightfully so. And I think the FAA has done a nice job of elevating that issue. So, um, but, but air, airports are paying attention and we're trying to figure out, you know, what, what are the needs that we have to meet? And, and John and his team in the Office of Airports has done a great job uh, working on vertiport design standards. What does that look like? Uh, electrical charging stations. Um, and then finally, just on the, on the environmental front, you know, what, what can airports do to uh, reduce emissions and, and help uh, the industry, you know, reduce the overall uh, carbon footprint of the industry? Those are all questions we're asking. I think that's a little bit in the future on what we can do, but just wanted to highlight some of those things uh, from the airport's standpoint. Thank you very much, Justin. And I'd uh, like to show, uh, have John share his thoughts on this as well, please. Thanks, Glenn. And Justin uh, definitely mentioned the first part I was gonna talk about, which was the shortages in funding. So that is uh, one of the key <laughs> challenges that GA airports have, as, as most of us know. Um, uh, another point is that the physical real estate, a lot of the GA airports don't have the physical real estate to, uh, to improve like, you know, the geometric standards that, that would be necessary. Um, so a lot of that takes time, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's a kind of a combination between the funding and, and the physical real estate uh, challenges. Um, you know, there's 2,700 federally obligated GA airports that aren't certificated to, for air carrier service. They don't collect uh, passenger facility charges, and they don't have a lot of options for generating uh, significant sums of revenue. Um, so, and then there's you know several thousand 
more GA airports that aren't eligible for any kind of federal funding. So, you know, how do we balance that? How do we figure out uh, how to incrementally improve the safety of these airports uh, move, moving forward? Um, and I think that's, that's what we're looking at. And, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, as we look at the data itself, what are some of the, you know, the top um, issues that we can actually do systematically to improve the level of safety and really take it from, you know, the fatal accidents down and figure out which are the ones we can really prioritize and have, uh, you know, have the most benefit to aviation safety. Um, so that, that's the big part of what we're focused on. The, um, you know, historically uh, with, the, with the level of GA accidents compared to commercial, um, we're looking at, you know, runway safety areas. Uh, that's something we've, we've shown in our report. There's a lot of uh, obstacles um, that are uh, uh, within runway safety areas at GA airports. Uh, we did a lot uh, within the past uh, 15 years on the commercial, uh, commercial airport side for runway safety areas. Uh, we, and we've, you know, obviously we looked at uh, GA airports as well, but I think we need to prioritize that effort and see what can be done. And then uh, from the runway incursion side, looking at runway taxiway intersections at GA airports. How can we design them better to provide better clarity to, uh, clarity to pilots? And, and that'll be probably be coupled with the next capital improvement project. So we're not doing standalone projects and spending additional money on a specific project, but how can we couple those together that we, we can uh, provide maybe you know, preservation type projects, you know, rehabilitation type projects, as well as you know, safety and or efficiency projects at the same time. And, uh, Perhaps uh, most importantly, as we think, think about this, is the, really the communication and outreach between the FAA and the general aviation community. Uh, what else can we do working with our partners in air traffic and flight standards and working with uh, AAAE and ACI um, for uh, additional training and guidance and getting the word out um, on GA safety and things that, uh, that we have noticed uh, through our studies. So um, thank you, Glenn. You bet, John. Thank you very much. And actually, thanks to everybody. Uh, that's all the time we have for this panel today. But I really appreciate all of your thoughtful input. I want to thank, um, and I think we have some really solid ground here for furthering work together. I know it's this collaboration with all of you that continues to make this a safer NAS. And uh, that's certainly all of ours goal. Next, I'd like to turn it back over to Jamal, who has some questions for a group of FAA subject matter experts. So over to you, Jamal. Thank you, Glenn. And a special thank you to yourself and the panelists uh, that participated in that today. It was very, very informative. I'm sure all the attendees appreciated it. So what we're gonna do now is transition into the live Q&A session. And for those of you joining us on Zoom, you can submit questions by using the Q&A function. And if you're watching on the live stream, we've shared a link to our Q&A form where you can add your questions. It seems as though we've had a few questions come in already, which is a good thing. It just shows a level of engagement present in the GA community. Uh, luckily, we are fortunate to have a group of FAA professionals that are extremely talented and highly knowledgeable to help answer some of these questions that we're getting. And I'll introduce them as they turn their cameras and mics on so we can have the session go. Uh, first, we have with us Dr. Susan Northrup, who's a federal air surgeon at the Office of Aviation Safety. We also have Glenn Martin, who you've seen before. Uh, just as a reminder, he is the Vice President of Safety and Technical Training in the Air Traffic Organization. We also have John Dermody, a Director of Office of Airport Safety and Standards at the Office of Airports. And we also have Everett Rashawn, who is a Manager of Training and Certification Group in the Office of Aviation Safety. So now what we'll do is go ahead and dive in and take some questions from the audience. And it looks like we have a question from Jan on Facebook and Jan's question reads, how has the pandemic affected the FAA's support to the GA community? My son flies a Cessna 172. I wanna make sure he's going to be safe when he gets back in the air. Uh, Jan, that's a great question and can be answered a number of different ways by folks within the FAA. So. I'll pass to Dr. Northrup first uh, to get your input. All right, thank you. Well, in the initial phases of the pandemic, as, Dr. as uh, Mr. Dixon said, we extended the medical duration so that we could allow the AMEs to set up all of the engineering and administrative practices needed to protect both the well pilot and the ill population that we're serving. 
Uh, we did initially see an increase in processing times as the regional flight surgeons had to pivot from traditional uh, av aviation medicine for, for airmen to providing public health measures for the air traffic organization to make sure that we kept our facilities open when we began to see cases uh, coming into the facilities. Um, there are some minor processing or scanning delays. Nice to say that we are now down to two days uh, scanning time from receipt and our processing times have returned to pre-COVID levels. And we're working very diligently to get those even lower. One really good news story is last November, we had an, an aeromedical summit with several of our stakeholders to include AOPA and EAA. And we listened to them and we took their concerns and went back and we're re-engineering some of our processes to include improving our letters so they're written in plain English and increased outreach activities. Excellent, thank you for that, Dr. North. Uh, Glenn, do you have anything you wanna add from your office's perspective? Thanks, Jamal. Um, certainly, as it has men been mentioned before, uh, in certain areas, the pandemic has certainly not slowed general aviation. We've got numerous airports uh, mentioned in Florida, Southern California, Arizona area, where we've actually seen traffic increases during this time. So we've been full speed ahead. Uh, for the FAA safety, uh, runway safety program in particular, we continue to expand our outreach, uh, trying to maximize participation in all of our briefings and webinars. Uh, we're working with local flight base operators to tune in to our From the Flight Deck series and videos for the airports that we have gotten to, as well as the special topics that we have already uh, made for this. So certainly encourage your son to reach out and get information pre-flight so that they're more prepared or he's more prepared as he gets to his destination airports. Uh, we've also expanded our partnering. Uh, we have just recently partnered with the National Association of Flight Instructors. Uh, kudos to our flight standards organization uh, for helping us get with uh, the NAFI, as we reached over 1,600 viewers for a discussion around surface safety and wrong surface landings. So a lot of opportunity out there to learn or just become more aware as you begin to consider taking uh, those flights. I do expect our virtual summits and meetings will continue. We have done some where pilots and uh, controllers have been able to talk and discuss situations about flying in a uh, specific airspace, raising that awareness of the traffic flows and the expectations from both the pilot and controller. These have proved very beneficial as well. So continue to expect a lot of opportunities to outreach. Again, can't emphasize enough reaching out to us and taking advantage of the things that we have available before they get in and start flying again. But we're out there every day trying to keep the uh, operation safe and uh, look forward to him participating uh, as a Cessna pilot. Excellent points, Glenn. I appreciate that. Uh, Everett, I'm curious to hear your perspective on the question. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, certainly, Jamal, and, and uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for your question, uh, Jan. You know, personally, as an active pilot, uh, like Jamal and, and like uh, Deputy Administrator Mims and, and others here that have been uh, with you today. Um, you know, I share your, your son's passion for flying and I share the passion with my family as well. Um, we're all familiar with the challenges created by the pandemic, but it was a great opportunity today to hear from senior leaders and the FAA, as well as industry on, um, you know, some of those, those opportunities and novel opportunities to assure uh, safety. Uh, you know, for example, and again, you've heard it, um, you know, alluded to, which is that the FAA issued the Public Health Emergency Final Rule, SFAR 118, which balanced safety with continuing essential operations by providing extensions to certificates and, and to currency and val validity. Um, so that was uh, a, a great cooperative effort. Another example is the FAA's increased use of video conferencing technology for oversight of GA operations. Uh, what's near and dear to my heart because I work in the general aviation and commercial division is the FAA safety team, which has done a fantastic job with, with safety promotion and outreach. 
the use of webinars um, through that technology has reached a, a large number of pilots, which have bridged that gap when, when pilots were not flying because of the pandemic. And, um, and we're looking for other avenues to, to keep uh, mentally uh, sharp with their, um, with their activities. In short, uh, the pandemic uh, validated, um, in my mind, the FAA's use of critical thinking and risk-based decision-making to find innovative solutions to issues and concerns that work for stakeholders, the FAA, and, and pilots like your son. Thank you, I very much appreciate that. Uh, looks like we have another question from Maria on Twitter and she asks, does the FAA have any guidance for AMEs regarding pilots who have had COVID-19 infections? Uh, Dr. North, this sounds like it's firmly planted in your wheelhouse. So you wanna take a few minutes yes, to answer that question? <laughs> Certainly, we released the guidance for aviation medical examiners on March 26th. Uh, and essentially, unless an airman was treated in an intensive care unit or has long haul COVID-19, the AME may issue if the airman is otherwise qualified. If you have had COVID-19 and we're in one of these two buckets and you want to speed up the process, I suggest getting your admission and discharge summaries, the clinical ones from the hospital and a current status report from your treating physician to take with you to your AME's office. Excellent answer. To the point, I like it. <laughs> we have another question from Scott and Scott asks, what new challenges can we expect to see in the post pandemic world in a full mass? And how are you all positioning yourselves to react? That is a wonderful question. Glenn, would you happen to have any insights on that from your perspective? Glenn, I think you might be on mute. Go ahead and click the button. Oop. Sorry about that. Thank you, Jamal. Good catch. Apologize. Uh, Scott, thanks for the question. Uh, I think I would start by saying I'm not sure we we're really seeing new challenges. I think uh, it has been a challenge to adapt to some of the needs that we have for reaching people and, and sharing with them information and so forth. But we are full steam ahead and continue to be focused on reducing risk in the operation. And uh, I expect us to continue there. I would share with you two key focus areas for us. One is getting the right knowledge and skills to the stakeholders, and the other is leveraging technology. We do expect to continue to have an increase in participation during our runway safety action team meetings. These take place at each towered airport every year. And the objective, of course, is to get local stakeholders together and analyze the data and the concerns that they have at those airports and to continue to use um, any means possible, be it uh, virtual or in-person meetings as we move forward in order to get the best representation of the stakeholders together to identify how to improve operations at the airports. We are, so, are working diligently to address proficiency issues with pilots, technicians, and controllers. We are improving our use of social media and are showing great success with our outreach uh, using the Fly Safe website, as well as the FAA Safety Briefing Digital Magazine that's been recently out, specifically focused on some of the surface safety issues. A great publication if you haven't seen it yet. On the technology side, we do continue to try to shape some of the technology specifically from the pilot's perspective to try and help in that learning and education. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the runway safety pilot simulator has gotten a lot of great uh, people to come to it and gotten feedback on it. We also, again, have our From the Flight Deck video series out there. Another piece of technology we have put out is called the Taxiway uh, prediction tool. This is a, an alert system for in our air, air traffic control towers with surface surveillance, which allows us to alert the controller when an aircraft has missed a line to a taxiway upon arrival and uh, giving the controller a warning to help with the pilot to try and take appropriate action if that occurs. So again, getting the right information to the operation and increasing our use of technology in useful ways will can really be the challenges and, and certainly the solutions that we'll be pushing forward uh, with the future. And so thank you. 
Thank you, Glenn. That's very, very helpful information. It looks like we have on our YouTube, YouTube platform, we have a question from Ryan. And his question reads, we also have not heard much lately about airports being closed down because of development, noise issues, or other pressures. Do we still have a problem? More broadly, what is the general state of the state of GA airports in the NAS? That is a phenomenal question. Uh, John, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on Ryan's question. Sure, Jamal. I thank you, Ryan, for the question. Um, I think really... Um, it's not really a widespread problem for the federally obligated NIPIUS airports. It it's, uh, seems to be a myth that, that kind of lingers out there. And it's, it's really um, what we've seen at the non-NIPIUS airports, um, the privately owned ones that have closed and been redeveloped. Uh, but those airports usually have all the, they're, they're very small facilities, first of all, and they have all their airports nearby. Um, so we've heard, we've heard this issue coming up. But I think it really is limited to those those non federally obligated airports, the smaller ones. Um, and it's rare for uh, for Nippius airports to close that have enough traffic that are viable. Obviously, there's a lot of competition within uh, within the uh, the general aviation airports um, and the activity. Uh, obviously, there was uh, um, there was pretty robust activity during COVID. Um, so it hasn't been an issue that has uh, has uh, come to the forefront. Um, as far as uh, the community noise, um, it's often a concern around airports, obviously. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as the FAA and, and airport operators, uh, they, they continually uh, let the pilots know that they should be following noise abatement procedures whenever possible to help mitigate that, those noise uh, uh, concerns. Uh, but it is rare for airports to close because of noise. And, um, you know, more broadly, I guess, for... Uh, uh, the state of the NIPIUS airports. Uh, we did, uh, Justin mentioned earlier, we did publish the uh, NIPIUS report in September last year. Um, and there's 3,304 public, uh, existing public use airports and uh, six proposed airports on top of that. Um, so, uh, and it, they're estimated approximately $43.6 billion in AIP eligible, eligible and uh, justified airport projects. So, a lot of needs out there, a lot of demands. Um, as you all know, um, there's been you know three different grant programs that have come out uh, to help in this regard. Um, and, you know, there's been the CARES Act, uh, the CRISA uh, program, and uh, the new uh, upcoming airport grant program that's called ARPA or the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so a lot of that they we provided uh, about 250 million dollars in direct relief to general aviation airports uh, through these programs. And the, then they're very broad as far as what they can cover. They, they cover operating costs and salaries and training and other, other needs of the airport, not just uh, normal capital improvements at an airport. And both the CARES Act and the ARPA Act provide 100% federal share for AIP grants in 2020 and 2021. So that's also some financial relief that are provided to the airports uh, themselves. Uh, so I, I think, you know, our outlook on, uh, on the GA airports is, is very promising. Um, I think uh, the, uh, the needs are there. Uh, we have programs to provide uh, federal assistance uh, to support those needs. Um, so uh, uh, I think we're in really good shape with the, uh, uh, the, all, the, uh, the state of all state of NIPIUS airports, I think you mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great answer, John. I'm sure we all appreciate it. Unfortunately, we've run up against time constraints. So that's all the time we have for the live Q&A session. I know there are folks who have asked questions that may not have gotten an answer yet, but fear not. We will definitely make it a point to respond to all those unanswered questions via email to make sure that your questions are answered. So at this time, what I would like to do is go back to Administrator Dixon for some closing comments. Thanks, Jamal. Great job. Uh, a lot of a lot of lot of uh, dialogue to get through in a very short period of time, but uh, very impressive. I want to also thank everyone who participated uh, today and everyone who took the time uh, to engage uh, in the conversations. You know, as we said at the beginning, uh, it's really important for us to be self-aware, circumspect. Uh, and, uh, and humble about our approach to safety in this world. Uh, some of you have heard me say before that, uh, you know, we had a, uh, our uh, stability and predictability 
our attributes of a safe system. And we've had a lot of disruption uh, to the aviation system over the past year. And so processes uh, like coming together to talk about issues, uh, focusing on data, as several folks said, so focusing on processes and focusing on the basics, you know, things like human factors, uh, considerations, and, and how do we work together? That's that's how we're going to be able to get through this um, successful successfully. If you think about it a year ago, someone said on one of the panels, uh, we, we jumped right into the deep end. And uh, as we come out uh, on the other side of the pandemic, hopefully over the next few months, uh, we will be in a, in a new normal in, uh, in the country and in business and uh, in all aspects of aviation. And so I think the thoughtful uh, application of some of the opportunities uh, that we have talked about that have been, that have been presented to, our, uh, to us as best practices will be really important and will add a lot of value uh, to our safety dialogue and processes as we, as we move forward. So it'll be really important to integrate uh, those things um, into our safety systems. Today was a great example, I think, of how we can learn about these things uh, from each other. And I think it's, it's certainly apparent uh, the diversity and uh, dynamic nature of the general aviation community, diverse uh, operators, perspectives, airports that we don't see to the same degree in, uh, in uh, commercial aviation and uh, military aviation. So that's another thing I think that it's really important to, uh, to take advantage of. So again, I'll say uh, what I said at the beginning, I think the best is yet to come uh, for GA. And of course, my door is always open uh, when we want to uh, talk about safety issues. It is the highest core value of the Federal Aviation Administration. I know of everyone who took the time to participate today. So thank you for listening and thank you for, for participating. Uh, fly safe and stay healthy. And we will see you all again soon. Thank you.